over the last few videos, we've been focusing on the difference between a hypothesis and a theory. And we're going to tie it all together at the end and talk about the levels of truth in science. But in this video, we're going to focus on the idea of scientific laws. And I will start by saying they don't exist. So that's it. We can stop the video now. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Don't do that. You have to understand what they mean by it, even if I don't agree that there are such a thing as a scientific law. Uh, the way that we use the word scientific law, it doesn't really mean the same thing that it means laws in society. I want to start by saying that because when you think of a law, you think of this thing that's a, like a consequence for breaking it and something that really shouldn't be broken and it, or it can't be broken. But think about it, even in society, laws can be broken. So, But the way they try to make sense of that in science is that this is this thing that can't be broken. So even then, it wouldn't make sense to use the word law, would it? Because laws can be broken. They shouldn't be broken, but they can. You know. So if you're trying to talk about something that never is wrong, that's always true, that can't be broken, that's not really what the law means, right? Um, it's, so let's think about that for a second. And then think about the fact that in science, things are always changing, that we always look to question everything. So when you put all of that together, it doesn't really make sense to talk about laws in science or things that are never changing. But still, what are scientific laws? Scientific laws are basically statements of fact that are accepted as universally true perpetually and explain a specific natural phenomena. So this is a, a statement that explains a one thing and it's always true in every circumstance forever. That is really what a law is supposed to mean. It's supposed to be concise and specific description of a natural relationship that is consistent throughout the universe. It's like an analytic statement based on a lot of evidence that is a constant across the universe. In other words, it's completely accepted as universally true and it's never going to change. It is true, it is invariable, and it applies in many scenarios, and it should not be really be changing. Now, that means that it's been observed time after time after time with little or no contradiction. Now, when you really look at the way it is in science, is that these things called laws, and we're going to talk about some of them in a second, uh, are not actually true in every single example that you can think of. And there are some examples which contradict them. So just like real laws in society, it seems like they can be broken after all. But then the whole point of making them universally and perpetually true doesn't really make sense, does it? So what are these laws? Okay. Another thing I also want you to understand is that theories uh, in science are often contain uh, statements which are called laws. For example, the theory of genetics includes the uh, for Mendel includes uh, two, uh, three laws, you know, the law of dominance, the law of uh, independent assortment, and the law of segregation. What those things mean is that these are the precepts by which genetics is governed, all right? And this is going to be true in every case. But then why is it that the law of independent assortment doesn't work in every case, all right? So you see what I'm talking about? It's like you can't really use it as a word law that's supposed to mean that this is what it works in every case and then there's exceptions for it. Likewise, for example, you have in science that idea from Newton's law of motion. These are the things that explain how objects actually move around. You've probably heard of inertia, action, reaction, force equals mass times acceleration, all of these things. You've probably also heard of Kepler's law of planetary motion, the law of, of a large, of large equal areas, the law of ellipsis, and the law of a period you know he, all of these things are explained in his uh, to, to explain the way the planetary motion actually works and yet science has shown many ways that his, his theories are not exactly his theory of planetary motion his laws of planetary motion are not exactly accurate 100 percent of the time and that there's actually now a better way of describing even though we still use kepler's laws in many examples uh, we now use relativity uh, numbers in most cases that we want to talk about interplanetary travel and things like that. So uh, better math, better theories have been come up to explain the same phenomena. So why is it that we still call them laws? Again, the law of gravity, a great example. You have the idea that objects that have mass attract each other and fall in a straight line towards the floor. That's how Newton put it. Uh, and actually, the for original idea was Galileo's. Uh, and actually, Newton was the one that put the numbers into that law and, and actually made it into a mathematical equation. But we no longer use Newton's mathematical equation unless you're doing a high school science experiment. Nowadays, we use relativity theory and general relativity, which includes Einstein's description of gravity to talk about the way that gravity works. In fact, objects do not fall at all. What? 
Mr. Lima, I'm sorry, but if I let my my cell phone fall right now, it will probably crack. Yeah? Yeah. If you don't catch it, it will crack. But it didn't fall, though. Mr. Lima, just, it's, it, it, it's falling. What are you talking about? Well, you think it's falling because in your mind, you've always been taught that way. And perhaps it's the easiest way to describe in the way you see it. But what you fail to realize is that the curvature of space and time is being bent by the mass of the Earth. Almost like a sheet of paper, when you put something on it, right, what happens to it? It folds downwards like this, like you see on the screen. So that means that any, we are like little ants, which are rolling down the hill because of the, of the fact that the Earth's mass disturbs the space-time continuum where it's around it. That explanation puts gravity in a completely different picture and tells you that when things are falling towards the ground, they're not falling at all. They're not going in a straight line. In fact, what they're doing is they're rolling down a gravity hill. So you can never truly fall. You can only roll down a gravity hill. That means the next time you take a tumble and you fall down, you can literally say, I didn't fall. I was just rolling down. You'll still get hurt if you fall from a building, though, because rolling or falling, you're still going to hit the ground too fast, right? But that's not the point. The point is that the way we understand gravity has changed. And the laws of gravity that you know Newton wrote in mathematical equations are useless in science when you're trying to use them to do things like launch satellites and probes down to the space. If you launch a rocket using Newton's equations, you will miss the moon entirely because you forgot to account for the fact that space is curved. Okay, so that means that when I go from here to the moon, I'm going, I'm not, I can't really go in a straight line. That's correct. In fact, light from the sun going towards the earth does not go in a straight line, but it's bent. In fact, we can see a star that's behind the sun, even though you shouldn't. Doing a solar eclipse when a moon goes in front of the sun and you, the light of the sun is blocked, you can see stars which are behind the sun. Almost like, you know, you can't see my face anymore because my hand is in front of it. But stars behind the sun are still visible next to the sun doing an eclipse. Kind of like my hand is now visible behind my hand. Why? Because the light of that star is being bent around the sun, around the curvature of the gravity of the sun. It's called gravitational lensing. You see, that's actually evidence to prove the new theory of gravity, which is now Einstein's relativity theory. But you know, what if I tell you that that theory is also being revamped? Because now we understand that gravity is actually caused by things called gravitons, or particles of gravity, which ch also, again, change our understanding of how gravity works. I love the gravity example because it really does make you think about the idea that laws don't really make sense. Even something as fundamental as the law of gravity doesn't make sense. Remember the Newton's law of motion we were talking about two seconds ago? They also don't make sense. All the equations that Newton came up with, are we still use them, we still talk about them, and the concepts are still true, but the math is all wrong if you use the equations, if you consider the fact that, for example, the faster something travels, the slower time goes by for them. And without getting to specifics into relativity, because this is what it is, again, Einstein screwing Newton up, he came up with the idea that the faster something moves, the slower time goes by for them. That's, that's just called time distortion. And it's, it's part of his original relativity theory, you know, and which is special relativity with, uh, without a gravity in the middle of it. But the cool thing about the, his special relativity theory is the idea that that means that if I'm going faster and time is going slower, that should be measurable. And it has been measured. When you send someone out to space with an atomic clock, this is a clock that ticks very precisely. It only misses one second every one billion years. So it's a very, very accurate clock. You get two of these cesium atomic clocks next to each other and you sync them together. Put one in the space shuttle, send one to space. One week later, the space shuttle comes back. It's a few ticks off the clock that stay on the ground because the clock on the ground is actually traveling faster since time for that clock went faster because the space shuttle was traveling at thousands of miles an hour and that means that time slowed down for that space shuttle. In fact, satellites which are in space have to tick slower and we that's part of our lives because if it wasn't because of that we couldn't use things like GPS or phones or have satellite TV or any of that stuff because the all of the stuff that happens in space is happening slower because they're moving faster. Isn't that crazy? That means Newton's laws were challenged. Kepler's laws, we no longer use them because of relativity. Gravity, not Newton's version anymore. What about the laws of thermodynamics? Certainly not those laws. They're so important. They can't, there's no way you're going to deny that one, Mr. Lima. Energy and matter can't not be created or destroyed. They can only change forms.
The total amount of energy and matter are, has to be constant. Well, s tell that to a black hole. When matter falls into a black hole, it's still present. It can be felt by the, the, the gravity effect of that matter, but it stops existing in time and space. So in other words, that matter does no longer count, even though it does. It's a paradox in science. But an interesting thing is that science has shown that around, in and around black holes, matter ceases to exist and comes to spontaneously exist out of nowhere. It's one of the crazy concepts in science. So that means the first law of thermodynamics is not always true. That's interesting. Another law of thermodynamics says that in a closed system, all right, the entropy of the system will always increase. That means that confusion gathers over time. Energy tends to get disorganized as you transfer from one form to the other. You know, you know, ice is very nice and neat, and then it melts into a puddle. We'll talk about that when we do ecology later in the year. But the idea of second thermodynamics is that disorder is is easier to achieve than order, and that tends tend to get disordered over time, not more ordered. Even that theory has its exceptions when you look at the early history of the universe during the Big Bang. Things don't really fit. It's like the laws of physics were different then. But then it's not a law, is it? So I'm going to finish this video then with a food for thought for you here. The idea of law in science is problematic because you're assuming that something will be invariable and always true. But the very nature of science is to question things and try to change our understanding of things and to explain them better over time. The very nature of science is to say that we will never reach an ultimate conclusion, a final conclusion statement or a theory of everything. Even though science has changed slowly because it's based on a lot of evidence and it takes a lot to challenge the ideas which were established by so much evidence, even things which are held as sacred as you will fall down a hill can be challenged by someone that's creative enough to see a better explanation to describe that. So in science, there isn't really a concept of loss. But we still use that term to describe a specific condition. Basically, what we're trying to describe when we use the word loss is a statement that is almost always true and that is describing almost every situation. But we are still willing to accept the possibility that one day data will change our way to understand things and that those things might be revised. But the idea of law is almost like this is what governs this phenomena. So that's why we say that sometimes theory includes statements of laws. Okay, but a theory does not become a law or a law become a theory or vice versa. It's not like, you know, once you have that theory uh, tested so many times, eventually you develop a law out of that. It's, that's not how it works. In fact, what happens is that a theory may include laws, but laws in the sense of statements that seem to be almost always true with almost never being contradicted. But we still understand, especially in modern science, the idea that Laws are not really set in stone and that they almost exist to be broken, right? At least in science. And so that is the idea. Just like in society, science laws can be broken. There are exceptions and therefore they're not truly invariable and universally true. And that's why I say there are no laws. They're just postulates or precepts or statements which are part of a theory developed by this theory to describe the way that the universe works as we currently understand it and that for now seem to be almost always universally true. So think of scientific laws the same way that you thought of hypotheses. There are, but hypotheses are predictions and while scientific laws are extremely tested statements that describe the relationship or something that happens in nature. So just like you know when you test a hypothesis significantly and consistently it becomes part of a, of, of a theory in the theory may include several hypotheses. Likewise, within a theory, you may have these several laws because it's been tested so many times that what you once called a hypothesis, now it's a statement that seems to be almost a statement of fact. But it's basically something that is unvariable and applicable in so many circumstances that we call it a law. But remember that we keep an open mind to realize that that could change. 
So Allah, it's like a hypothesis that's been tested and tested so many times and it's been consistently uh, defended by the data that we now incorporate it as part of the theory as a statement that is almost invariable.